Hey folks, Quillyteen here, and welcome to another episode of our tutorial for EU4 for complete beginners. We are playing as Castile, and in the last episode we looked at our overall diplomatic situation. We figured out who our enemies were going to be, both in terms of uh, our targets, Granada, an obvious target, and Aragon, both a combination of a target and a threat. Uh, this episode we're actually going to start developing relationships. Now at this point you might be wondering, hey Navarra, it's just a one province minor nation. Why aren't we planning on attacking them? Well, and you can, and frequently that will in fact happen, that you as Castile, or as Aragon, or as France, someone's going to go and attack Navarra. They are a one province minor nation. Right now, they have no relationships with their, whatsoever. They have no alliances, nothing of the sort. Most likely, they will form a relationship. Now, we can't declare war. They, they change this. It, it used to be you could declare war on turn one. And if you go and check, like, a lot of the EU4 wikis and advice and things like that, a lot of the sort of walkthroughs for various countries have you declaring war on the very first turn of the game um, before people can form alliances. Well, they just recently changed it. You're not allowed to declare war for the first 30 days. That way, it gives all nations a chance to develop some alliances. I actually think that's going to be better for game balance. Um, so we can't instantly declare war on Navarra, and there's a very good chance by the time December 11th rolls around here, they're going to have an alliance. They might have an alliance with France or Aragon or someone like that. So if we were to declare war on Navarra, it might be a little bit scary. And we would like to conquer Navarra. And why is that? Well, primarily because we can, and also because they're yellow and we're yellow, and we can't allow that to coexist. We obviously have to combine that together. So what we're going to try to do, and this is the other reason I'm not planning on declaring war on them, is I'm going to try to develop a diplomatic relationship with them and to vassalize them diplomatically. So a vassaled country is com uh, completely subservient to their boss. Uh, to their Is it like a suzanate or something like that? I can't remember the word. Um, so effectively, it's the same as belonging to that country. Technically, they're still, you know, they have their own color and they're still semi-independent. But if the parent country goes to war, the vassal has to go to war. Also, the vassal gives half the taxes to the parent country. So it's quite nice. Also, it guarantees that really no one can just go and conquer Navarra because conquering Navarra would be the same as just trying to declare war on us. So that will ensure that that land stays with us. So we're going to develop those relations. Now we have three diplomats. We can see that up here. We haven't really looked at what this stuff up here is. We will in the future. But right up here, we can see we have three diplomats in total and three of them are available. We can also see that in our outliner over here. There's a little button that you can expand the outliner. The outliner is the greatest thing there is. It's lovely. It gives you a breakdown of a lot of things. Um, if yours doesn't look quite like mine, don't worry about it. There's a little plus here where you can enable and disable things. But there we go. We're going to look. So we have three diplomats. Cristo, Odon, and Valeriano over here. Three guys waiting to be sent out to make friends and influence people. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Now, what is our plan? We are we are going to make friends with the Papal States because we have that as a mission. Uh, and I think we'll make friends with Portugal. We're not going to try any sort of weird daring moves over here, especially with Aragon at our east, who are our rivals. We need some more friends, so we'll, we'll look at making friends with Portugal. We'll also look at developing a relationship with Navarra over here. And finally, it would be very nice to develop a relationship with France. Now, we looked last time. France likes us a little bit, but they're mostly neutral. We do have this enemy of enemy modifier that I don't think we saw in the last episode. Because we have both rivaled the same people, we get a relationship boost with each other. Enemy of enemy. It starts as zero, but builds up by one every month. And it caps out... I'm actually not sure. I don't remember where this caps out. I want to say plus 25, but it might be lower. It might be plus 20 or plus 15. Um, I don't think it's any higher than plus 25, even though we do have multiple rivals um, in common here. Um, so that will build up, which is good. And it's worth noting, we can't currently ally them. We can, we can hit this button, right? This button is lit up, which means it's a legal action for us to take. If we hit here on the screen, we can see France will not accept. There's no, um, there's no randomness here. There, this green bar, if it's past this yellow line here, they will, they will for sure accept. If it's below it, they for sure will not accept. So we know for sure France will not accept. And why is that? Well, we can look at all the breakdown of modifiers. Right now, they like us a little because of a positive opinion and our diplomatic reputation. And also our navy's a little bit impressive. We have a plus one. But for attitude-wise, they're currently at minus 20 because they have a neutral attitude. Again, they like us, you know, they, they, we're okay, but they don't, you know, they're not warm towards us. They don't particularly care for us. We can probably change that later on. Also, they don't think our army is particularly impressive. Our army is weaker than the French army. That is a penalty to our alliance because we are, in a sense, weaker than them from a mili uh, an army point of view, not as much a navy point of view. Let's compare Portugal over here. Can we ally Portugal? Yes, absolutely. We actually have a minus 50 to our alliance modifier here because 
Portugal is allied to our rival. We have rivaled England. Portugal is allied to England. That's a minus 50 modifier. Huge. But we actually have tons of positive. Portugal is not neutral towards us. They're actually friendly towards us. We also have a more powerful army than they do. We have a really good opinion, we have a lot of trust, and we have a positive diplomatic reputation. You can see there's no naval modifier here because we have about the same naval power as they do. But they would be quite happy to ally us. We might want to start with that. Uh, Navarra, yep, they'd also ally us. Um, Aragon would definitely not. And actually, we're not even allowed to ally them because they're our rivals, so that's a no-go. Um, and uh, we can't ally Granada. I mean, they wouldn't say yes because they hate us. But not only that, we hate them. The second number, this is Castile's opinion of Granada. And even though we're computer control, we're human controlled, so we get to make a lot of decisions, our countrymen hate Granada so much that they will just refuse to support any alliances with them. So the button's not even lit up. Fascinating. Let's take a look at the Papal States. We know we have a mission to get our relationship with them to plus 100. We have an enemy of enemy uh, modifier. We both agree that Aragon sucks. So that's going to build up over time. But we have to get the plus 100. How can we do that? Well, there is an option under Relations Actions over here. There's this Improve Relation button. If we do that, what happens is we send a diplomat to, to the Papal States, and he just sits there for weeks, months, years, whatever. And every month, he will improve our relation a bit. He will build, create a new modifier here that we'll see later called Improve Relations. And it will tick up every single month. And it caps out at plus 100. I, I, I don't know exactly how the value is calculated for how much he improves your relation. It seems to be between 2 and 3 by default. It'll sort of vary a little bit. So it's clearly there's some fractions involved. And I'm not sure what all the modifiers are. But it'll be around there. He'll improve our relation, uh, the Pope's opinion of us, uh, by about 2 every month. So... It can get all the way to plus 100, but that will take 50 months to do, which is quite a long time. It's just a little over four years, um, but that will develop the relationship. So that will be a plus 100 modifier in addition to everything else. So if we did nothing else, we would get to plus 125, right? Same religion, plus 100 for the improved relation, and then whatever the enemy of enemy modifier it is. But that might take a little too long. We want to complete that mission faster than that. So we can offer the Pope an alliance. And an alliance, if they say yes, and they will, happily say yes, um, an alliance will give us a plus 50 relation. So let's hit send. So we have sent an alliance offer to the Pope. Have we allied them? Not quite yet. It's going to take 12 days for our diplomat to make the round trip from our capital of Toledo all the way to Roma and back. 12 days for the entire trip. Um, we don't have to wait 12 days for the response. We will always get the response the day after. So if we just advance the game by one day to the 12th of November, we will get a response in, at that point, which is good. We still won't have this diplomat back for 12 days, but we'll get the response right away. They will say yes, we know that for a fact, and the yes will be worth plus 50. An alliance is worth plus 50 relationship, which is great. All right, while we're at it, let's go ahead and ally Portugal. But we can't, it's grayed out, why is that? You have to wait a day between sending alliances. Again, it's just sort of a game mechanic to stop someone from spamming out all the alliances and really having weird things happen. You just have to wait one day in between so that the game can sort of update itself. All right, so well, I mean, we still would like to ally them. Is there anything we'd like to do? I guess we could just sit and wait, but we could still send them a diplomat. We could improve relations with them. Eh, it's fine. Let's take a look at dynastic actions over here. We can offer them a royal marriage. So a royal marriage means, I don't know, we're going to marry our daughter to one of their third cousins or you know something of that nature we, we we tie our family lines together a little bit strengthen the relationship between the two dynasties um and that's a great way to boost relations if you do a royal marriage you'll get a plus 25 boost to your opinion of each other which is pretty good in addition to that declaring war against each other starts to suck if you declare war against someone you have a royal marriage with you will lose stability um which means it's also a really good way to defend yourself against aggressive war declarations um even if you don't have an alliance, it just makes it less likely that someone's going to be willing to declare war on you. Uh, you know what? Let's go ahead and royal and royal marry Portugal. We're going to stay really good friends with them. And I'm going to send one more royal marriage offer to Navarra. Because if we want to vassalize Navarra... Now, Navarra is actually willing to become our vassal as is. Because we're so big and powerful and also a little bit scary, they would be much happier being our vassal than being conquered outright. So, they would accept, but... The game does not allow you to offer vassalization until one, you have a military alliance, and two, you have a relation of at least plus 190. We are plus 38, or 39, just updated as I moused over over here. 
Um, we have a plus 39 because of the same religion. We also happen to already be the same dynasty. We have the same last name. Um, and we have a little bit of border friction, but that's not a huge problem. So we have to get to plus 190. Now we can get there. Royal marriage will be worth 25. Alliance offer will be worth 50. So that's plus 75 from where we are now. So that puts us, what, like 115-ish, something like that. And we know we can improve relations for the last 100 points if need be. We can also um, send them a gift. We can send them money. So let's go ahead and send the royal marriage offer. Cool. So all our diplomats are gone. It's going to take three days for Navarra and Portugal for those diplomats to make the round trip. Twelve for Rome, for Roma over here. And in a day, we'll get an answer to all those three requests. And we know they're going to say yes, which is good. Um, I could unpause now and let it happen. Is there anything else we might want to do before then? Well, we haven't really looked at a whole lot of stuff. Um, we haven't looked at our military. We haven't looked at our ships. <sighs> okay, we're going to start talking about trade here. Um... Actually, I kind of want a trade to be its own video, but I sort of want to set up the trade right from the start. Hmm. Yeah, all right, let's tackle trade. So trade is a big, hairy topic because it's got a lot of different modifiers and a fair amount of complexity. But the true fact of the matter is, after a tiny little short tutorial, you will know 95% of what you need to do with trade. Um, and that's going to be fine. You can, you can get into the nitty-gritty later. You can... Um, set up a, a spreadsheet to track all the different modifiers if you really want to min-max absolutely everything. But we can get you 95% of the way there with a relatively simple um, introduction. So first, actually, before we talk about trade, because trade mostly involves using some ships to do some stuff, we're going to talk about our units. So we got our troops here. I mean, we, we compared before, right? Aragon has the 10,000 troops here. We have 12,000 in Toledo. I can click on this army to select it. We get a bit of a breakdown of who's in the army. This army has 12 regiments. It has nine regiments of infantry, nine regiments of cavalry. And right now, all of our regiments are at full strength, which is a thousand people, thousand people for regiment. If we go and do battle with this unit, even if we win the battle, some people on our side will die, which means we will still have nine regiments of infantry, for example, but we may only have, I don't know, 8,200 men left, for example. And those will be reinforced over time um, without us having to do anything. So there's a bit of a difference between a regiment and the total number of people available. So we have this army, it's got two different types. There's also artillery we'll get later on, but for right now, we're limited to infantry and cavalry. Um, and we've got another group right over here. Uh, our second army, seven regiments of uh, infantry and three regiments of cavalry. We can move people around. If I have you selected, I can right-click on Leon over here. I don't know if that's how it's pronounced, probably not. Um, and they will make this move from Asturias to Leon. How long will it take? If we mouse over the army in the tooltip, it says it will arrive in Leon on the 20th of November. It will take them nine days to walk from one province to another. That's, that's, again, it, this, this game, things take time to have them happen. But don't worry, time can pass very quickly once we do unpause. We can click on the distance province over here and they will path their way over to that province. We can also, if we do like a partial move, I can hold shift and then do something like that. And it'll queue up the moves. They'll move to Burgas first via uh, Cantabria and then end up in, in Leon over here um, along the way. So those are perfectly fine moves. Maybe what I'll do with this army is I'll tell them, hey, why don't you move here to the center of the country? We'll get sort of both our armies in roughly the same place. We're going to talk about combat mechanics later on. Uh, once we actually get in a fight, we'll talk about how armies deal damage to one another and um, what you can do to maximize your chance of winning. Um, but for now, what I'm going to still talk about is morale. So on this army, so you've got the country flag of the army, you've got the total number of people in there, and then you have a green bar on the right. This green bar on the right shows you the current morale of the army. And the morale is effectively the hit points of the army. Okay? Now... When you are in combat, you will take casualties. You will lose numbers of men. But the way that you actually win or lose a battle is running out of morale. A country, in a battle, both armies beat each other up and people are going to be dying on both sides. But the first army to run out of morale loses the battle and will then retreat. Okay? So most of the time in Europa and Versailles 4, one army is not annihilated. You will lose, let's say it's a 10,000 stack against another 10,000 stack, but one army does better than the other. By the end of the battle, when the losing army runs out of morale, the winning army might have lost 2,000 men. The losing army probably would have lost a little bit more. Maybe they lost 4,000 men. So now they, they, are, they're, they only have 6,000 men left, but they still have an army. That army will then just break and retreat and run away to friendly territory automatically. Uh, you won't be able to control that army. 
it will just run on its own to some province and then when it arrives in that final province it will then sit there and try to get reinforcements and also replenish its morale so morale determines whether you win or lose or battle okay um and you do lose morale based on how many casualties you take in the battle. But we're going to be looking at those mechanics later on. But now, it's worth noting, so we have a morale in this army. Currently, it's at 2.95. Is that good? Is it bad? I don't know. Whatever. It's it's some number. It's about three is its current morale. And that's its army. But we're not currently at war, right? We're not fighting right now. Do we care what kind of state these troops are in? Not generally. And we can actually save a lot of money if we get these armies to kind of stand down. We're not going to disband them. But right now, we're paying maintenance on all these guys to keep them at full war readiness, you know? We're keeping all their, their pole arms sharp. We're keeping all their uniforms dry clean or whatever. You know, we've got them at full maintenance. Um, all the supplies are in there. They're drilling every day to make sure they're fully practiced. We don't really need that right now because unless Aragon decides to go crazy YOLO mode and attack us instantly, we're not going to be in a war for a little while. We're certainly not going to declare in a while. So, um... What if we save some money by reducing the maintenance of this army? What am I talking about? So we're going to go to our country management screen over here, and we're going to look at the economy tab. Money is one of the most important things in this game. Diplomacy, probably number one. Money is the second most thing. If you don't have money, you can't really build troops. You can't do a lot of things if you are broke. Um, so money is a very, very important resource. Castile actually starts as one of the wealthiest nations in the game. Um, let me take a moment. This is not terribly important, but there's a button down here for the ledger. Okay, that's down here. The shortcut key is L. That's usually what I do. I hit L. And this ledger is huge. It's got tons and tons and tons of different stuff. And it's got that stuff for literally every country in the world. Or every country you're aware of, which later on will be every country in the world. For example, I can get a breakdown of the full army stats of every single country I know about. Presumably, you know, it's not exactly espionage, but, you know, it wasn't necessarily hidden knowledge and you have merchants and peasants and stuff that roam around and so you can get that information which is pretty useful like if we go to aragon which should be alphabetically at the top i assume right over here we can find out they have 18,000 troops in total which is really interesting because we can only see 10,000 currently but they have 8,000 troops somewhere it could be sitting in the fog of war over here you see how it's darker we don't have vision there we have vision along our border and that's it so they could have troops over here could be on one of these islands could be, could be lots of different places, but they do have more troops than we can see, which is very interesting. But on this, we can also get a breakdown of, um, is it just under country? Yeah, so income. So we could sort by income and see every country's income. The, the Timbers right now are quite wealthy, England, Ottomans. This is this is raw income. Um, and then we got Castile over here. As Castile, we have a raw income of about 21 gold per month, 21 ducats per month. Um, and that puts us fifth in the world. Castile is a very wealthy nation to start off with. Aragon, almost as wealthy. And Portugal is pretty high up. I mean, this is a huge list, right? So Portugal is a fair bit lower than we are, almost half our income, but still pretty potent overall. So really rich countries, and later on, we'll just be richer. There's a lot of stuff going on on here, and we'll certainly be looking at um, how we make money, which is on this side, and also how we spend money. But right now, we're going to take a look at this section here, army maintenance. So right now, we're playing, paying 6.4 gold a month. To keep our army in tip-top fighting shape. We don't need that right now. We're going to grab the slider and bring it all the way down. Bring it all the way down. You still have to spend half. So instead of paying 6.4 per month, we pay 3.2 per month. So we're still paying half the maintenance to keep the army around. But we're going to save a lot of money. Our balance, this is our net balance. You don't tend to look at the total income or total expenses, generally speaking. You mostly care about what your balance is. This is the amount of money you're going to make every month or lose every month, depending on how things go. So now we went from 0.7 or from 7 gold per month to 10 gold per month. Basically, we're making 50% more money by dropping our army maintenance down, which is cool. You'll notice on the armies, the little green bar has turned yellow. And that indicates the fact that we are not at full, ma full maintenance. That's a hint. That we're not at full maintenance and because we're not at full maintenance our morale is going to drop right now our morale is still basically three you can see our maximum morale is 0.51 as if we were to unpause the game and let time pass actually i think it would have to wait until the end of the month because obviously your budget changes happen once per month so i think it's if our maintenance for our army is still down there at the end of the month then our morale will update and we'll correctly list our morale as 0.51 we are at one sixth of our our normal morale while we're at low maintenance 
Um, which means if we were to get in a fight now, we'd almost instantly lose the battle. And honestly, everyone in our army would die. There would be no retreat. We would break instantly and be utterly destroyed. You don't want to go at war with low morale. But at peace, it's a great way to save some money. So that's great. We've just done that. We've got a fleet maintenance here. We're going to leave the fleet maintenance untouched right now because there's going to be some things we can do and mostly you're going to play with this army maintenance slider and generally it's either going to be all the way at the bottom at peace or all the way at the top at war um, you could go midway for different things but we're going to ignore that for now so that's a great way to save money so what are we going to do with the money how much money do we have now well we have 221 gold in the bank right now and we are we know at the end of the month we're going to make another 10 which is again quite a bit at this stage in the game. Later on, you'll be making, you know, 100 gold or more, but for now, 10 gold per month, amazing. So what are we gonna do with this money? Well, we're gonna pay attention to one of these other little notification flags down here. We're gonna do the first one. You have free advisor slots. What the hell does that mean? Well, if we click on it, it just brings us to the first tab of our country viewer, it brings us to the government tab. And we can get some information about this. We'll find out we are a kingdom, specifically a feudal monarchy which has certain modifiers. We find out that our culture is Castilian. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. And there's some other stuff, you know, things all over. We're gonna talk about a few of these things very, very soon. But you can also see we've got these three advisor slots and we can assign advisors there. Before I do that, it's time to talk about monarch power. So one of your most important resources is monarch power. The others are, Certainly money, right? This is our treasury over here. And then we also have manpower. Manpower represents how many people in your country of, of, are of age to join your military. These are people willing to join your military. If we were to recruit more regiments, you would recruit them from this manpower. So building a regiment would take a thousand people from your manpower. Also, if you take losses in combat, your existing regiments will be reinforced from this manpower pool. So in that combat I talked about where say we lost 2000 people, right? So we would still have, say in this army, we'd still have our 10 regiments but we don't have 8,000 people in these regiments. Well, the missing 2,000 would be taken from the manpower pool over the next couple of months, and then we'd be fully reinforced. Um, so those are two very important resources, but the others are these three powers, administrative power, diplomatic power, and military power. These are referred to as monarch points. And these points represent sort of how much, I don't know, diplomatic capital or political capital you've built in within your country. You can affect change by spending these power points to do things. One of the most significant ways in which you can spend these power points is to improve your technology, okay? There is a technology screen over here. You can take a look at technology. We'll be looking at this later, but it's worth noting, for example, here, if we're gonna mouse over this bar, we can see it would currently take us 598 administrative power to improve our administrative technology to the next level. And generally that's it. The baseline is about 600 points to increase your technology. That's one of the most significant ways you can spend your points. But there's a lot of other ways you can spend your points. And this is how much we've got. We've got 56, 56, and 70 um, uh, power points at the start of the game. How many are we gonna get per month? Well, we can actually see here in this pop-up that we're gonna get five military power per month and four and four. We can also see that from the government tab. Four power, four power, five power. Mil and again, monarch power is most one of the most valuable resources you can have. So you want to improve, improve this as much as you can. Where does this come from? Well, every country has as a base, they get three points per month in all three of the categories, right? You can see here, base value is three. We also see on the next line, it says Juan II's administrative skill plus one. Our ruler is King Juan II of Trastamara over here. And he has a certain skill rating. He has one skill in administrative, one skill in diplomatic, and one and two skills in military. And those directly impact how many power points you get per month. That's really what this is. This just gives you a bonus. So you can see here at the military, indeed, we have the base of three and plus two from his military skill. That's awesome. Well, is it? Your skill of your ruler ranges from zero is the minimum skill and six is the best. So your best possible ruler would be a six, six, six and that would generate an enormous amount of uh, power points per month. It would be amazing. The worst possible ruler is a zero, 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 which is what Enrique is over here. Enrique is literally the worst ruler in the game. He is god awful, and your Karen King is not particularly good either at a one, one, two. Spain, or Castile rather, he's still Castile. Castile suffers from a relatively slow start because of their incredibly poor rulers. Some nations start with really good rulers. Let's take a look at Aragon over here. Aragon's got a two, four, six, amazing. 
Um, that's actually kind of scary because it guarantees they're going to be able to improve their military technology a lot faster than we are, which is not something that's, that feels very good at all, I can assure you. What about Portugal? They got a 4 2 one. A pretty good administrative skill, a little bit weaker everywhere else. So that, that definitely hurts. Is there anything else we can do to improve our power points? We can't change our king. Nothing we can do about that. Um, can we improve our power points some other way? Yes, by getting advisors. So let's click on this first button over here. And we can see we have three advisors available. And that's, that's the norm. Every now and again, you might find yourself in a situation where you have fewer because of reasons. Uh, and sometimes you might find yourself with more people to choose from. But three is the normal choice of advisors. Okay? They all have names, they have an age, they have a price to hire them, and a monthly maintenance as well. All of these advisors also have a sort of unique ability. So Esteban over here is a natural scientist. We can see that if we mouse over, it says natural scientist. That's his class or his type of advisor. And a natural scientist will give you 10% more production efficiency. We don't know what that is now, but that, that sounds good. I don't know. It's green. It's clearly a bonus. That's good. Okay. Um, uh, Federique over here is a philosopher and he gives us more yearly prestige. Okay. Prestige. Yeah. Prestige sounds like a good sort of thing. That's good. And uh, Gonzalo gives us 10% more taxes. Hey, that sounds really good. We'll make more money from our taxes if we take Gonzalo. So that's their ability based on what type of advisor they are. So he's a treasurer, philosopher, natural scientist. In addition to that, they all have a level. Okay, they all have a, a level of, a, of their skill. So both Esteban and Federico over here are level one advisors. And Gonzalo is a level two advisor. You can see based on the number. The level of advisor is how many power points per month they will give you. So these two will both in give us an extra admin power per month, and Gonzalo over here will give us an extra two. Well, that's pretty good, but the cost goes up significantly. Um, the cost to hire is partially based on their age, which is why um, Esteban is a little cheaper because he's a bit older, so he's more likely to die sooner. Um, Gonzalo, though, is a lot more expensive, and that's because of his power. And more importantly is the monthly maintenance. Level 1 advisors cost 1. Level 2 advisors cost 4. Level 3 advisors cost 9 gold per month. It's the square of their level. Level 1 advisors are really good value. One gold per month for one power point per month is amazing. Unless you're playing a flat broke country, you almost always want at least a level one advisor in all three categories. As you get wealthier, you may want to look into level twos or level threes, but clearly right now, this one guy would cost us 40% of our freaking balance. And if we ran all three categories as level two, we would be losing money per month. Right now we can't afford a level two. So we're gonna choose one of the two level ones. Which one am I gonna take? Eh, sort of 50-50. Um, because of reasons, I will take the production efficiency guy, but honestly, it doesn't matter too much with these options. Some of them have really important bon bonuses that are really important for certain situations, right? Depending on how things are going, you may really be looking for a particular type of advisor. Uh, in here, um, we wouldn't mind a higher prestige, although the production will be nice, and once we talk about trade, we'll see why that is. So we're going to take uh, Esteban over there. We're going to grab a diplomatic advisor as well. So we got a couple of level twos and a level one. We know we only afford the level one guys right now, so we're going to take Alvaro here. He gives us more powerful spy offense. That's really not a particularly important trait, but okay, let, let's go for it. Better relations over time improves anything that ticks over the course of time that either improves a little bit every month, or if it's a bad modifier that goes away a little bit every month, which can happen, uh, this um, diplomat will help you burn that away. Uh, Bertrand over here is really nice with more trade efficiency. He will be, that, that trait will be really good for us later on in the game. But right now, there's not enough trade for him to be effectively paying for himself. So we'll grab Alvaro. We don't care about the spy offense. We just want a level one advisor. And military, and these are somewhat randomized every time you play. And again, in military, we have two level twos. They would be too expensive. So we're going to grab the level one, another Alonzo here. Uh, this guy's going to give us more fort defense. Not a particularly critical trait. The morale of armies bonus would be a lot better. But again, he's level one, and that's fine. So now, instead of doing four, four, five per month, we're doing five, five, six. Okay, so we've got extra power, which is groovy. And that establishes most of what we can do with our money. However, the final thing is we are going to talk about the Navy and we are going to talk about trade. And look at that. I filled the whole video. Next episode is going to be dedicated to trade. It's a big topic, mostly because this trade map mode map, very intimidating. But once you get to, you know, again, by the end of the next video, you will feel very comfortable about trade. You'll feel like a trade master. Thanks for watching, folks. See you next time.